Um, so would the witnesses like to introduce themselves for the record, please? Thank you. And welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paula Higgins. I'm the founder and CEO of Homeowners Alliance, set up 12 years ago to support and campaign on behalf of homeowners and those who aspire to own, and that includes leaseholders, of course. Uh, my name is Sue Phillips. I'm a leaseholder. I'm a former shared owner and I set up Shared Ownership Resources in 2021 to uh, campaign for the best interest of shared owners and people considering shared ownership. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Bob Smitherman. I'm Chairman of the Federation of Private Residence Associations. I've been a leaseholder in my own block for over 30 years. I've been a um, director of my block for 25 years, um, self-managing, and um, thank you for the opportunity for um, putting the case for resident management companies across England and Wales to this um, exciting piece of legislation. Well, thank, thank you. you for coming here and helping us with our deliberations. So I'll call the first uh, f uh, member for a question. That's uh, Matthew Pennycook. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for coming in this morning to, to give evidence to us. Uh, I'll return to perhaps to, to Ms Higgins and Ms Smitherman if, we, Ms. Smitherman, if we've got uh, time in the session. But could I start with two questions to, to you, Ms Phillips, on shared ownership? The bill makes provision for the treatment of intermediate leases in a number of areas, but it doesn't uh, contain, as far as I can read, any measures um, to directly resolve many of the challenges that shared owners face. I wonder if you can give us your general views on the bill from a shared ownership perspective. What's missing? Uh, what might we look to include um, if we could? And then secondly, the, the government tabled over 80 pages of complex amendments to its own bill yesterday. Among these are amendments that would exclude certain shared ownership leases from enfranchisement and make the new valuation method for calculating the premium payable uh, for shared owners non-mandatory. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at those, you may not. Um, I wondered if you could give us your views on those specific um, amendments. We know that sh uh, enfranchisement for shared owners is expensive, it's challenging, but nonetheless is it um, a regret on, uh, from your point of view that these amendments have been tabled? Okay. I'll start with yesterday's amendments. Um, I'll start with yesterday's amendments. I have had a look at them. I've called around legal experts and of course it's far too short notice for a legal expert to comment, let alone a layperson like me. So what I'll concentrate on the evidence is what I would like to see in the bill. I can't comment on the degree to which those amendments will achieve that. So I just want to make it clear. I can't comment specifically on the amendments. Um, in terms of the bill generally, I mean obviously it's aimed at leaseholders. Shared owners are a very specific <coughs> subset of leaseholders. They generally face additional problems over and above the problems faced by leaseholders. They have fewer rights and protections under law. Uh, they face additional burdens and also they have fewer protections under consumer protection including new build codes. So they are generally disadvantaged and as it stands the bill does not represent a better deal for shared owners. Now, partly, that's because of the issues that you have referenced. Um, shared owners are sometimes, not always, in very complex ownership arrangements. So, whereas there are problems for leaseholders generally, you've got the additional party of a housing association in the mix. That can cause... I could talk for half an hour on this. I'll try and be very concise. I'll just pick out one example. That relates to, for example, the fact that shared owners don't have a statutory right to lease extension. If they did, they would have a right to a 90-year extension. As it is, in the absence of that right, some shared owners are in complex arrangements where their landlord is a sub lessee with only a short interest in the lease themselves. So are actually incapable of offering the equivalent to the, um, to the benefits that a leaseholder would get under the statutory route, unless... Um, you know, you kind of go through a process of extending all the leases and all those costs are passed on to the shared owner. So there is a, there's a real problem there that isn't addressed in the bill as it stands, on my understanding. And have you explored sort of any quick fixes in terms of what we might look to, to try and persuade the government to, to incorporate? I think the problem with looking for quick fixes is that shared ownership is so complex, you run a risk of creating unanticipated unanticipated consequences and I think those particular questions are better directed at, um, at a lawyer or a legal expert and I hope you will do that this afternoon when you have legal experts presenting their views on this bill. Brilliant. Thank you. 
You don't have to, so don't feel that you have to. I'm not putting you on the spot. The, one thing I would add, and I'm so pleased that Sue's here and done amazing work on shared ownership, is that, and I, again, I'm not a legal expert, but looking at whether you're looking at asking people from retirement housing sector as well, because that's also a very complicated form of tenure with exit fees and whatnot, and whether they can actually go have the same rights to challenge fees and things like that. So I'm not sure if that is covered in some of your evidence sessions, but retirement housing is notoriously known for, um, you know, sort of quite scandalous fees and charges. And I think just to add to that, what certainly we see a massive increase in um, sort of shared ownership memberships coming to us for membership of residence associations, um, and obviously we're helping them through that. But I think in terms of quick wins, I really hope that the government will, in, in, you know, finally implement um, an independent statutory regulator for property managers. I think that would be a really quick win to help leaseholders. Um, I think it's um, very disappointing that we haven't got there yet. So I really hope an independent regulator um, for, for these management companies that hold large amounts of um, um, leaseholders' money. Thank you. Uh, Barry Gardner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Phillips, uh, the shareholders, uh, sh shared owners, rather, um, under the Renters' Reform Bill that's coming into Parliament, um, we'll get forfeiture, um, a, an improvement on, on mandatory grounds of possession for which relief can't be sought in the court. Um, do you support in this bill the right to abolish forfeiture? At the moment, I, I believe, as a shared owner, you, you have less security of tenure, do you not, than uh, a private leaseholder? Mm. Because it, perhaps you could explain what uh, a housing association, for example, um, who owns the other part of, of, of a shared ownership apartment, can do um, to you in circumstances where there's a, a dispute over service charge and, and uh, non-payment. Yes, I think what's relevant to your question is that um, what, one of the things I would want from this bill is that shared owners have all the rights that other leaseholders have, but of course, as your question flags up, they face problems over and beyond the problems faced by leaseholders. Um, the problem for shared owners is that if they, uh, I'm not going to speak to the like, specific technicalities of this, but you know, if they fall behind with payments, they are liable to... Uh, possession with no reimbursement of the equity they've invested in their property. Yeah. This is because they sit more as a tenant right. than as a homeowner. I certainly would like to see and that. And it really addressed. is an equity trap, isn't it? It is. Now, what I would say is that housing associations will say that they will do their utmost to prevent this scenario playing out and that numbers are low. And whilst that may be true, I don't think it's an argument against shared owners having the same protections in law as other leaseholders. So... If this bill were to introduce um, uh, a provision that uh, forfeiture were abolished and that uh, so that the with a debt of say five or ten thousand pounds you couldn't lose the entire value that you have in, in in the property as a leaseholder, should that right similarly apply to shared ownership leaseholders? I think shared owners should have the same right as other leaseholders and they should not be liable to lose their investment in their home due to a relatively small debt, Indeed. absolutely. Indeed. I would also add that I think it's a hugely important issue, but it's probably an issue that affects a fairly small minority of people at the moment and that there are other issues arising from this reform process which affect a great many more shared owners or all shared owners. So it's an important issue, but I wouldn't like us to fit to take up a disproportionate amount of time in this session. Okay. Um, shared owners, you pay service charges uh, as well as rent, <laughs> um, and you are disadvantaged if there is poor maintenance of your buildings. Um, so do you agree that uh, shared owners should be allowed to claim the right to manage, um, as confirmed in the recent Canary Gateway case? Hmm. 
I'm going to say that my expertise does not lie so much with right to manage claims. So what I would say is they should have, as I you know, reiterate, they should have the same rights as any other leaseholder. I think what's in, more important, what's specific to shared owners, is that they are liable for 100% of the costs of repair and maintenance. And I think there are two separate issues within that. One is the issue relating to the model. In previous sessions... So people... I, couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said there. Oh, sorry. Um, one it... is... So one is to do with the model, and one is to do with the transparency around the model. So on the model itself, in previous sessions on Tuesday, people have talked to um, the unfairness of, of generating income streams from leaseholders after the profit made on sale of the initial share. And I think that the 100% liability for service charges that shared owners have falls within those kind of questions and it should certainly be looked at as whether it's proportionate for shared owners to pay 100% of charges and again there's a great deal more I could say but I'm aware of the time limitations. The second issue is transparency. In evidence submitted to the Leveling Up Housing and Communities Committee inquiry into shared ownership, one of the themes that has come out of the published responses from shared owners is that people don't seem to be aware at the point of sale of their liabilities in this respect. So if we can't tackle that 100% liability in this bill, given time constraints, at the very least, regulators should be paying more attention to the nature of marketing and whether it is fair, transparent and compliant with consumer protection regulations. So you asked me earlier for a quick fix. I certainly have a quick fix around transparency, and it's that the... Um, the relevant regulators should be looking more closely at transparency about the model as it stands up until we have meaningful reform of the areas that are problematic. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, in conversation with my colleague Matt Pennycook, um, you talked about the, the lack of statutory lease extension mm -hmm. provision. Mm -hmm. um, the Law Commission said that shared owners should have the right to extend do you consider that that would be a, a welcome uh, amendment to introduce into this bill? I think it's essential. I think, and this relates to the marketing that I've talked about. Shared owners come into shared ownership believing that they are a leaseholder like any other leaseholder. They have no reason to think differently. It's sometimes, there's often a caveat emptor attitude. And I think that this is reprehensible, to be honest, when you're talking about provision of social housing to households who are by definition financially vulnerable compared to people who can afford to buy outright. Um, it's not a failure of their due diligence, it's a failure of the government, the housing sector and their agencies to spell out the difference between assured tenancy and leasehold. So there's a moral compass argument that they should have the statutory right to lease extension because of the manner in which they've been sold those short leases. There are separate debates I think to be had about whether 99 year leases were missold. A recent ruling by the ASA which outlined that it is likely to be misleading not to provide material information about the costs of lease extension suggests that certainly there's an argument that those short leases have been missold. We can't change that. Most of those shared owners will be outside any kind of scope of limitations for redress. The least we can do is to ensure that lease extension is available not only to future buyers but to current shared owners who have been left with a lease which... There's an issue here about the right and the afford to take up the right. They should have a right to lease extension but that right should be made affordable. Now if you're sitting there with a 50 year lease or a 60 year lease or a 70 year lease, even if you've got that right to statutory lease extension, it might not be affordable to take up that right. So there's a whole basket full of issues to look at here and I would encourage collaboration with other regulators and with the Leveling Up Housing and Community Committee to resolve those issues. And, and, and one last one, Barry, because all the other do that. Uh, I think I might have time to come back to you if you have more. But, okay, but, so no, cool. fine. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll allow us. Thank, thank you. Andy Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paula, can I come to you, please? Your um, organisation, the Homeowners Alliance, has described the bill as a huge missed opportunity. Uh, because the um, opportunity to include uh, flats in the uh, changes wasn't made in this bill. Would you, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on that? 
I feel very strongly about that. So this is going to be a really missed opportunity. This, these types of bills will come once every 20 years. You know, so you must start finish the job that you started on. We see that in the 2002 Act, we had the common hold. It didn't happen. So if we can do something, if you can't get common hold sorted before we go, why don't we have all new flats being built has to have have to be share of freehold, have to be sold share of freehold within five years. Have a sunset clause. Say no new no new leasehold flats over after a certain time. If you don't do it now, the next opportunity is not going to arise. So I feel very strongly you've got lots of people who are waiting. We've got people coming to us every day saying, I'm waiting for my lease extension. I'm waiting. The government's going to do something about it. We've been waiting for years. 2017 is when we put out our report, which showing even 43% of leaseholders didn't even know how much time is left on their lease. They're not expected to be experts in this. They're buying a flat to live in. So it's a real missed opportunity if we don't do something on this and it'll come back to bite us. Thank you. Bob, is, is there anything you want to say? On, on I, I, I just want to completely echo that. I, th I, th I think certainly for us as an organisation in 2002, I think we were really hoping that the government in the 2002 Act would have banned new leaseholds. Um, and I think actually the, the sector will be in a very different place had we done that. Um, I think this is a really good step, this bill, and I really hope that we can get this bill as a first step um, and, then, and then we can build on it from there. I would, I would hate to think that we try to sort of make it sort of perfect and we end up with something less perfect. I think this is a really, from our point of view as an organisation, this is a really good starting point. I think this is the beginning of it, I think as Paul has said, but actually it's a really good opportunity to sort of actually get it right, really. But um, but yeah, 2002, unfortunately, was a bit of a missed opportunity to ban, um, you know, um, leaseholds for blocks of flats, really. Can I, can I just stick with you for a second, Bob? I'll come back to you in a second, Paul. But from, from your perspective as, um, as the chair of the Private Residence Association, um, can you just talk us through the sort of main elements of the bill that will apply to your organisations? I th thank, you, th thank you for that opportunity. Um, in terms of residence associations, obviously our organisation is called the Federation of Private Residence Associations. To be clear, we are talking about groups of leaseholders that come together democratically within their blocks of flats. We're not talking about neighbour watch groups and those sort of residence associations. So to be clear on that, um, there are very different sorts of residence associations that come that come to us for membership. There's those more informal groups, which um, you know they don't meet the sort of 51% percent um, you know, um, you know, you know, um, threshold for um, for recognition to be an RTA. RTA. Um, then, then obviously there are that group of recognised tenants associations that are formally recognised by their landlord. And then there's um, the RMCs, which probably are the majority of our members. Um, there's RMCs like mine, which has got what's called a tripartite lease, which I'm sure members will understand, where you have an external freeholder and then you have a landlord that has responsibilities, which enables people like me and my block to basically act as a common holder. You know, you know, we're a limited company, limited by share. I'm a shareholder in my block. I'm elected every year as a director and we manage our own block. Um, and, and then of course there's those RMCs that may have a different arrangement with their freeholder. Um, and, and, and I think that's where the ground rent bill, I think has been very helpful last year coming into law um, because obviously there was a number of th um, clauses in there, which I'm sure we don't need to rehearse today where there was doubling and tripling of ground rents and things like that. So there are different sorts of residence associations, but I, but I, I, I would argue on behalf of all of those, those certainly our members across England and Wales, um, that actually this legislation, you know, is a really, really good starting point for all of those. And, and, and I would encourage leaseholders to come together in their buildings and, and to take control of their buildings democratically, working with their neighbours. So what do you think is missing from the bill that would benefit your members? Um, I, I, th I think at the, at, the, at the moment, I would like to see this over the line, in, in, all, in, in all honesty. Um, I, th I think that, that there's the conversation to be had, and I think as Paul mentioned about common hold, which I think can come later on. Um, but it's, it's, uh, in, in terms of blocks like mine, where we've, we've got those controls already, there's absolutely no advantage to us in, in, in banning leaks sold on my block, because actually we've got all the controls we need. You know, as, you know, as, as, a, as a landlord, which is what we are democratically, as the directors elected by their shareholders of a limited company, we are the landlords. So we actually have the ability to, to, to manage that estate democratically. We hold an annual general meeting. We comply with the company law like any, any, any companies. And hopefully that would encourage more volunteers like me. I'm a volunteer, I don't get paid for what I do in my block. Um, but actually, I'm really passionate about working together with my neighbours democratically to make my estate and members of this committee are very welcome to come to Worthing, um, down on the south coast, to see actually how we manage to manage our own block, because I'm very passionate 
about actually working together to make a real difference for the, our neighbours and friends where we live. Just, just so well, I understand... One more, Andy, and then I'm going to oh, move okay. everyone in. But go on, one you. more. Oh, thank you. Just so I understand, you don't object to leasehold continuing, but it's it, what's your view on new leasehold? Is, is that... Um, I, 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 think, I think all new developments should be common hold. OK. Um, well, you know, um, and as I say, it's a shame we didn't do that in 2002, but I think, as Paula said, I think that's an opportunity to do that now. Um, but I wouldn't want to throw everything else out at this point, um, you know, to sort of die in a ditch over that, um, because actually I think there's some really good stuff okay. in the um, in the build. Thank you. Right, I'm sure I'll have time to come back to people. I Thanks just you. want to get the first batch in. So, Mike, Mike, thank you. Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, to, to, to Paula, you, you also said that ground rents have not been tackled by this bill. Could you elaborate? Yeah, on that? I think. What changes would you like to see? Yeah, I think. The, that was sort of a the statement was put out. I think at the time with the King's speech, yes. it wasn't clear. And then I think it was it sounded like it was just the government was going to consult on the ground rents, which is what they're doing now. And it closed yesterday, and we welcome that. So I think at that time, I was concerned that the Queen's speech was saying we're just going to consult on what <clears throat> how to limit ground rents. So, um, but at the moment now, I think it's you know there's no justification to have a ground rent payment for nothing. Um, any payments that should be as part of the service charge. So I welcome the bill um, to, and I fully support uh, if you can not have the legal challenge of it being a peppercorn. But um, I appreciate, you know, some, or if, if, it's, if you can't have it as peppercorn, having it as a set amount that makes it clean and clear. So what we want is when people are doing lease extensions is that it's a calculator, there's no, they don't need to go and get valuers and lots of negotiation, there's lots of cost in there. You wanna make it as simple as possible, a process thing to extend their lease and get rid of their ground rent. That's great, and Bob and Sue, got anything else to, to add to that? Um, just to flag up that one of the distinctions between shared owners and leaseholders is that shared owners can't eliminate Yes. a ground rent via a statutory lease extension and that's a huge problem particularly because my understanding is that Homes England's guidance may previously have been that shared ownership shouldn't be subject there you know it wasn't mandated but there was an expectation that shared owners wouldn't be subject to ground rent there's massive inconsistency in the shared ownership sector so it's on all kinds of aspects but including the imposition of ground rent and the nature of that ground rent and whether or not you encounter it at the point of the staircase into 100%. Um, so, but ultimately, the key point is that shared owners don't have that resort to lease extension to eliminate ground rent at present. Thank you. Okay, is anyone who's not asked the question who wants to, who wants to come in, just please indicate. But I've got, uh, I've got Matt, Barry, and Andy who wants to come back. So I'll come to you, Matt. Two, two quick questions. Well, I, well, I've got you here on uh, slightly different subjects. The first relates to the purchasing of a, of, of a lease initially. In its 2018 consultation um, on implementing reforms to the leasehold system, the government committed to requiring freeholders and managing agents to provide lease, uh, leasehold information at the point of sale within a defined time limit and a, and a maximum cost. That's not in the bill. Would you welcome that being incorporated? And secondly, on the service charge provisions, clauses 26 <coughs> to 30. Um, in principle, they might work very well. Lots of detail to come via regs, but are there any specific ways you'd like to see those service charge uh, clauses tightened? Sure. Um, yeah, okay. I wasn't sure who you were asking. Yeah, just uh, anyone. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, on the service charge, I think it's, we really welcome standardisation, so having standard forms, and that's what we... As Homeowners Alliance, when we get over 4 million people coming to our website, we can present these. These are the questions you can ask. So I really, really welcome that and having everything to be aligned that it's similar. And I would, I'm sure we'll go on to estate charges and people on freehold estates. Um, the first question was sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. Uh, Just on, on whether, whether oh, the upfront information, yes. I think so. Again, what we see. Yeah, so what we see is that when we did our report back, our leasehold report, even though the estate agents are supposed to uh, provide even basic upfront information, half of the estate agent uh, things we're looking at um, weren't even providing whether the leasehold or freehold. We know there's work going on and estate agents are supposed to provide upfront information. We understand there's the BAPSI report, but the reality is it's not happening. It's not, it's... They're not regulated. They don't know what their obligations are. And this is the other piece, and it's particularly with managing agents, and it's what you mentioned before, is that we need to have re better regulation of managing agents, developers, 
housing associations who are promoting the shared ownership to make sure that they're giving the right up upfront information and to make sure that in blocks that, you know, you said you do the LP form right away, we know there's lots of delay there and that will, one of the reasons why buying and selling leasehold properties takes so much longer. So we really welcome having that upfront information and that's through the BAPC and that's probably through the regulation and management, having regulating estate agents and managing agents, which is another piece of the pie I think that would really be welcomed in this bill. I'd welcome to put this in the bill. On service charges specifically, anything on? Um, on service charges, I think it's it's about being um, transparent. Um, so I think some of the, the, some of the provisions of the bill is about having proper annual accounts, and so a lot of it's trying to get that information. So I haven't looked at the detail of all the clauses there, but it's about people being able to get that information, being able to, um, and and that's why you need to have regulation managing agents to be able to provide that information properly. So Phillips, I think you wanted to. Yes, in terms of information at point of sale, this is a little bit more complicated for shared owners. Um, they're often directed towards the lease, but the lease is, of course, silent on the issue of 100% liability for service charges, so there's an issue there. Um, they are often directed towards the key information document. I welcome the changes to the key information document in recent times, but I think they really do not go far enough at all and I would direct you to um, a report that I've written about the, the 2016 to 21 key information document last year which goes into detail on improvements I think should be made. Um, I think it's important to flag up that we need to look at not just content but also understandability and format and I've previously suggested I think it would be useful to benchmark with other sectors such as the pension sector on the um, the understandability of issues relating to risk as well as benefit and how to make sure that that content is communicated in a way that people do actually understand. Um, I'd make a final point. Uh, a lot of shared ownership marketing presents itself as education about the model and I think that can be problematic. Um, particularly because I think housing associations and their marketing teams are very upfront about the idea that their marketing promotes the benefits, but it's important that people understand the risks, the hazards, as well as the benefits. So we need to look very closely exactly where shared owners get their information at the point of sale and where improvements could be made across all of those areas. Okay. Uh, Bob, did I you think we would, we would certainly welcome improvements in the conveyancing process. One of the sort of things our members certainly see is actually you, you, they can get the information, you know, from a very specialist lease or lawyer, which is obviously really helpful. Um, but there are, you know, as in all, all sectors, conveyances out there where people sort of Google a conveyance, you know, and, and you and you end up, you know, you know, oh, that's just a standard lease. And of course, we all know there's no such thing as a standard lease. You know, they're, you know, their contracts are all very different. So I think anything that we can do, I know the lease on advisory service about four or five years ago did some work around st um, standardisation of information and so I think anything we can do to prescribe that I think would be really helpful. I think the issue of service charges, um, absolutely it's one word isn't it, it's transparency. Um, I, th I think all the disputes that we see around service charges is where managing agents sort of hide things because there's no statutory regulator, um, where land l landlords sort of you know kick accounts into the long grass because they don't have to. Um, I think, but you know, having, having a prescribed way of to, to be completely transparent about service charges is really important. Okay, we've got just over ten minutes left. I'll bring in Richard Fuller, and then we'll try and get back to Barry and uh, and Andy again. So, uh, Richard. Thank you, uh, uh, I was just uh, wanted to ask, given what we've just we just been talking about. So, we've been talking a bit about regulation, um, which is often seen as some sort of answer for problems, and infrequently is not or at least is different from simplification or standardization, which each of you have mentioned different points. So I'm just interested in uh, your thoughts when it comes to property managers and managing agents about where you think the balance between simplification or the interaction between simplification and regulation, and then with the regulation, whether it's a matter of uh, regulating the process, you must provide this set of information by this date, or regulating uh, the people that thou must have this qualification in order to do X, or whether it's about the process of redress, being able to then get some compensation at the end. Because we're going to be wrestling with all those things here, 
they all have a role to play to a greater or lesser extent, um, but we have the uh, the risk of just you know excuse my French, but vomiting out a whole new set of what we think is going to the solution. As you said, Ms. Higgins, we have a once in 20 years, in fact, I was just talking to another MP, I said this to uh, Mr. Gardner on the way in, he goes back to 1993 thinking about this, and he's an MP now. Um, so what are your thoughts? Give us some guidance on uh, simplification, standardization versus regulation, and then regulation of people, regulation of process, the provision of redress. Uh, Bob, or yeah. Shall I go first? Um, I, I think I wouldn't reinvent the wheel, would be my view. Um, I don't know whether you had the Property Institute in yet, um, Andrew Bulmer um, from ARMA. They, 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 they fill the gap as the, um, as the, as the, as the main um, membership organisation for managing agents. Um, Andrew will give you the figures of, but I, I believe they represent about 50% of all property managers of lease on property. That means there's 50% of people that are not members of ARMA, that are not part of their regime. Um, along with the IRPM, which obviously they're down merged to form the Property Institute. So I think actually working with Andrew and the amazing work that they've done to fill the void um, where there's been a lack of an independent regulator, I think will be a really good starting point for government to actually create a, 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 a regulatory regime. And certainly, you know, we would stand ready as an organisation to help with that. Because um, I think actually giving lease holders the confidence that there's an independent body that they can go to where they've got disputes with their property manager or with their landlord, I just think it's really important, as people do with, you know, you know, other things like, you know, off what and, you know, edit, you know, off GM and or you know, all those sort of having that independent regulator, I just think it's really, really important. Um, I think it's a really interesting point you made, and I think it's um it's interesting, so we also do stuff with new homes. What I don't want to see happen is that, you know, we legislate for new homes ombudsman, fantastic. We haven't enacted it yet. We now have a more confusing landscape for people buying new homes, who are probably also leaseholds, or probably also shared owners, yeah. where they've got another code and competing codes. And it's incredibly confusing. So I completely appreciate. And I also think that, you know, regulation, if it's it's an enforcement. So there's a lot of things that on estate agents that they've got to do now. And we know rightly from the research we've done that they're not doing what they should be doing. The problem is that people do not have the right to redress if something goes on. But there is something there about and you know you know more about the managing agents but the estate agents the developers the housing association who are selling these these dreams and if you've talked to you've seen lots of people on tuesday who feel they've been missold and they will continue to be missold and these estate agents they're the first port of call for the for people going into the process and we've got to remember that people are buying a home they have not done it before they haven't bought they might have bought a couch or something like that or you know you know they've gone through other process this is the first time they do it and they can get it so wrong and people need to be protected um, it's the only part of the professional world of the property that is not regularly the state agent and the state agent is that person there who's alongside the person buying you know trying to buy get, get, get their dream which could go that's massively wrong I don't know but the, when you say regulated you're in, yeah you mean they should have a qualification <laughs> that they can tick a box say I was qualified to do this or, or redress, as in there's a regulatory body above them. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's a really good point in terms of, and I know the, the ROPA stuff and um, and like that, we did give evidence to it. Um, and I know that actually tick box is probably not the right thing. So perhaps maybe it's more a proper one step, one place for redress, but that's usually the problem. I think is it Andrew that's mentioned the point is that that's the ambulance at the bottom, what's at the top. But what we don't want is that you know people doing online qualifications and you know getting a ticket and they can they can stop off you know jump up as an estate agent and come back down again. So um, so I appreciate the complexities and I look forward to seeing what your deliberations <laughs> will be like. Ms. Phillips, um, I don't have the expertise to speak directly to regulation of property management, but I'd just like to pick up a couple of related issues from the shared ownership perspective. Um, the first is that the um, evidence submitted to the ACA, ASA sorry, inquiry into Black Friday marketing highlighted the fact that industry sector standards around the marketing of shared ownership are lower than other standards that are out there. So for example, shared ownership is currently excluded from the um, New Homes Quality Board Code of Practice that simultaneously reflects the complexity of shared ownership, but also the sort of fact that shared owners don't have access to the same level of protections in relation to new build codes as other home buyers. So slightly off to one side there. I also wanted to pick up on transparency about service charges. Um, 
Transparency is clearly essential. People should know what they're paying for. However, shared owners shouldn't have to affect it, and other leaseholders shouldn't have to effectively take on an audit function where it falls upon them to scrutinise accounts. They should be able to place some degree of reliability on the accuracy and proportionality of the accounts that they receive. So how this is achieved, I can't speak to, but I think the owners should be on um, the providers of services and service charge accounts to be better rather than leaseholders and shared owners have more and more obligations to scrutinise and then take whatever follow-up action is required if problems are identified in those accounts. That's very helpful. Thank you. Andy, Ms. Siggins, can I, can I just ask you, um, do you agree that it would be appropriate to allow leaseholders uh, to withhold service charges where they have not complied with what are the very extensive requirements put in this bill uh, to provide accounts no later than six months and so on? Um, do you think that's uh, uh, an appropriate uh, and proportionate uh, way for leaseholders to be permitted to respond? I, I fully agree with that. So, you know, it's a bit like if you put a uh, get some building work done in your home, really, and the building work's not completed or whatever, you know, you withhold money. Um, it's it very happens in all construction industry. So um, I think that the stuff of the forfeiture, is, it's, 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 that's very disproportionate, isn't it? it indeed. Of so, yeah. yeah, no, I fully support something thank like you. that. Um, and very, very thank you. And thank you. Very briefly. Thank you also for what you said about um, wanting all new uh, apartments to be leasehold with the share of freehold, which I think was uh, also echo uh, echoed by Mr. Smitherman. Um, insofar as new new apartments are going to be uh, with the share of freehold, um, and Mr. Smitherman, you you indicated that you felt that um, you know you got the best of both worlds as as a director of a. a, a, a freehold uh, and enfranchised uh, uh, company. Yeah, I, I think ours is a tripartite lease. We've, so we have a, a ground freeholder that owns the land, yeah. and then we could, there's a, tri, um, a separate, what to say, a, a middle lease, which, the, which is the limited company, limited by share, which we're shareholders of. Yeah. If, if, as a leaseholder with a share of freehold, common hold became available, do you think it would be equitable and fair to charge you for the privilege of transferring to common hold, or do you think that more people would take the opportunity to transfer to common hold well, if that well, came? One word answer, time? please, because I've got well, to get. Uh, I, th I think uh, difficult. I, th I think it depends on the nature. I think if you've got a, a, a difficult freeholder, then uh, then clearly that, that that would be an advantageous thing to do. I think in my, in a scenario like ours. Where actually you've got a democratic limited company with the shareholders. So, so sorry, I can't do one with answer. Andy so Carter. We've got two minutes. I'm conscious you talked us a lot. Yes. Is there anything that you've not had the opportunity to tell us that you'd like us to hear, particularly from your relevant organisations? Paul. Um, so, the other thing I feel very passionately about, and this is so people Less than a come, minute. come to us, two minutes, is Less estate charges, right to manage. You need right to manage and make all new built estates that are adopted by the local council. I agree. The problems with estates, the charges can get over. Huge. The yeah. and service charges, rent charges, estate charges. The other thing I would flag up, please do look at resale of shared ownership homes. Yeah. There are yeah. issues there. Okay, thanks. Bob. Um, and to simplify the process of bringing lease holders together to form a resident association to speak to their landlord and manager with one voice. Thank you. Much appreciated. Hang on. Yeah. Order, yeah. order. Uh, so I'm afraid that brings it, uh, this question session to an end. Thank you for coming in and giving evidence to us. If we could uh, get ready for the next session, thank you. We'll chair. start as quickly as possible. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much.